with host Gay Howard and co-host Vincent M. Wales. Hello everyone and welcome to the Site Central Show. My name is Gabe Howard and with me as always is Vincent. Actually, Vincent wasn't able to be here today, so we have the... Well, what are you? You are the founder of Site Central and for all of those who listen to the Site Central regularly, which I'm sure is the entire audience here, you know Dr. Grohal as our resident expert. So John, welcome to your co-hosting duties. It's, it's excellent to be here again and I'm happy to fill in for the indubitable Vincent. I don't know what indubitable means. I don't either. Excellent. Excellent. Well, we are here live at the Society for Participatory Medicine Conference. That is my absolute favorite part of doing live podcasts. And we are here to host a great panel of experts to talk about, well, their lived experiences. So without further ado, Dr. Grohal. Sure. Um, if we could just go down the panel and have you introduce yourself briefly and talk about um, uh, what it is that you began to understand how uh, mental, mental health was connected to your health condition. So to briefly introduce yourself and then talk a little bit about that. I guess I'm starting. My name is Lee Lopez. Um, I am, have a master's in public health. Um, so when I became chronically ill, uh, with chronic migraines, um, I was already anticipating that uh, mental health would play a role in um, my overall wellness. But I didn't realize at the time how um, difficult it would be. Um, Thank you so much. Hi, this is Doug Lindsay. Um, I have a chronic illness and it was poorly understood. So I had a complicated relationship with mental health simply because it was difficult. It was risky to let strangers have opinions about whether I was sick in the head or, or sick in the body. So that's sort of you know some of the genesis of, of uh, how I how I related to mental health when I was homebound and bedbound for eleven years. Thank you. Hi. Is that my going on? eight months before I had refused to get a cancer insurance rider on my health policy because it would only pay for cut, burn, poison, and I kind of knew that first of all, I was low risk for getting cancer. And second of all, I knew that if I ever got it, I wouldn't cut, burn, poison. I'd use more holistic, natural ways of treating it. So, um, when inflammatory breast cancer has a 40 to 50 percent five-year survival rate and um, considerably less positive than breast cancer in human. And I knew I was going to have to do what I had always said I would not do. I was going to have to trust people that I had always held in some mistrust. Um, the depth of the problem that I had didn't reveal itself to me uh, overtly until a couple of days later when one of my nurses mentioned that I needed to have a port proven and I didn't know what a port was. And when she told me that it was, I was, I was already in a state because I knew I was going to have to let them dump poison into my body, toxic substances. And, um, I was already in state because of that and trying to wrap my head around it and become okay with it, okay, I can cope. And then I found out that what a port does is 
you know, it's a little nub of baking salt and keep your skin and then a, a little tube of cannula between the bread and your heart. And they dump these poisons right into your heart. Uh, that freaked me out considerably, quite a bit. Um, the night after I found that out, I was trying to prepare to go for another opinion in Virginia, trying to pack, trying to get things ready to go. And I, you know, that was between sobs. I would sob, I would break down, I would uh, rant and rave, I was shaking, I, I, I couldn't relax. I mean, I truly could not relax. And I finally collapsed into my rocker uh, late that night and thought, why hasn't anybody talked about this? Why hasn't anybody talked about this? Um, everybody talks about chemo. Everybody knows about chemo. Everybody talks about radiation, surgery. Everybody talks about that. Why doesn't anybody talk about ports? And all of a sudden, you know, there's that little teeny tiny sliver of your brain that remains disengaged from all the emotion that's watching what's going on. And all of a sudden, I have one of those moments. The reason nobody talks about warts is because it's no big deal. To everybody else, it's no big deal. To me, it was a huge deal. It was at that point that I had to stop and try to figure out. I realized that my reactions to my diagnosis were more extreme than what I gathered most cancer patients had. Certainly my reaction to knowing that I had to have a port, which by the way I still have, I forgot rid of it. Having once got it, she's in there. <laughs> um, my reaction to having a port was way extreme compared to other people. It's at that point that I had to back off and look at what was happening with me and say, you know, I think this isn't normal. Uh, and I realized very quickly that I had medical PTSD, not caused by the cancer diagnosis, but pre-existing for the last 50 years of my life based upon a couple of back-to-back -back hospitalizations when I was five years old, during which I almost died. So I now understand, I can see, I do things like in my life and I say, why don't I do that? Why do I have these repeating nightmares? Why do I, well, now I know why. Um, and that was when I first figured it out and it had an, in, it had an impact on everything that has happened from that moment forward. Thank you so much for sharing. To, to jump in on that for a moment and to present it to the rest of the panel, uh, one of the themes of the Society for Participatory Medicine is this idea that we separate out mental health and physical health. Uh, for some reason, even though the brain is in the body, it's, it's completely separated. And what all of you have mentioned is that you were diagnosed with an illness that's scary. And, and for some reason, scary is, is on the mental health spectrum, I guess. And doctors are reluctant to treat how you feel mentally or emotionally upon hearing what for many people is devastating news. Can you touch on that for a moment? I mean, you, you've got the physical illness that you were diagnosed with, but you obviously felt some way about that emotionally and mentally. Uh, sure, I'll start off. Um, I didn't always feel that migraines, um, but seemingly one day they went from having them maybe once a month, twice a month, to two or three every week. Um, I ended up having so many migraines that I was um, partially paralyzed for about three months. I lost um, the ability to move most of the right side of my body. I had to learn how to write again um, and take care of my children. And there was such a idea that maybe, <laughs> maybe that part of it was psychosomatic, that I was making my condition worse because I was so 
upset. And but how can you not be upset when you have this, you know, condition and, and it's happening to you and there's nothing that you can do about it? I have to wait for specialists and it feels so long. I mean, three months feels forever to wait for somebody to see you and tell you what's going wrong, like, and you can't fix it. And so you're just waiting and you don't know what's wrong. And that was the hardest part. And to not be believed made it even worse. And then I ended up um, being diagnosed with other chronic conditions that are related to pain. And there's always that, well, maybe, maybe if you just tried this or that or the other thing, you know, maybe if you got out more or exercised more or changed your diet, that maybe everything will go away and you have the life that you used to have. It didn't quite work that way. Thank you so much. Yeah, so those are comforting lies for 320 million people in this country, which is maybe if I don't eat string cheese and I eat kale, you know, <laughs> you know, I mean, so, so it's, you know, life is scary and life is hard and that is not fun to connect with. And when something slams into you and you have no recourse but to share the robo with this thing you're dealing with, you know, you have to figure out how to manage that, but you're also managing a world full of people who want anything other than to be in you. I'm sitting here thinking, gosh, I hope I don't ever get migraines. You know, that sounds <laughs> awful. <laughs> you know, so, so, you know, I don't, I don't want breast cancer. You know, so, you, so, so, when you grapple, I, I've always said one of the biggest problems in illness where the disconnect comes in is doctors are there, they want to help you manage your condition, and patients want to be young and healthy. So that's a, a very a different kind of good news. This can rain in your symptoms 11%, you know, a clinical trial shows versus I don't want, even want to know you because meeting you meant that something has happened rough in my life. Yeah. So, yeah, so when I got sick, we didn't have a label. My mom and my aunt had been sick for my whole life with no answers. And there was a reason I was at KU starting a biochemistry you know, research position, and it wasn't because 90 days in a biochem lab was going to give me the answers, but it could start to give me the background I needed. So when I got to college, I went to Washington Med School you know, before there was a med line, and I'm sitting there pulling up titles of articles, and I can't read the titles. And that's what was different, you know, when I got sick after my junior year, having had a year of biochemistry, organic chemistry, cell biology, bio, you know, all of these other pieces. Now it was like I could understand how the chess pieces move and I could get better at this. So the trauma of having something and having no name for it, and then having to deal with, you know, people who don't understand and, and you don't understand. You know, if you washed your foot because of a landmine, it's very clear people see it, but people can't see your pain, they can't, you know, they've had headaches and they don't quite know the difference. How is your backache not the guy's backache that chopped him into it? So you have to deal with all of those and then you have to deal with whatever's going on with you, which is either we have an answer and it's scary, or we don't have an answer and that's scary too. And so those are, and then, yeah, we have a medical establishment that doesn't that doesn't, scary is not actionable. And in fact, paying, acknowledging it slows down the machine because now the person who's taking blood and leaving and the person who's coming in to do the next thing, if they have to stop and be human, there's a lot of room to hide. So, yeah. so once I was laying in and waiting to go in the hospital and I could see the parking garage, you know, because I traveled out of town, and I saw this, I looked at all those bricks and I thought, my God, they can build a, a, a place this big just to park the cars for the people showing up that are sick. And it was an astounding thing to realize. So when you're running that, there's not time for everyone's feelings every day. So it's, very, it's, it's a, it is a real tension. It's not just a callousness too. So.
Just for a moment, I want to pull up something that you said there. Uh, Long-time listeners of the of the show, we're, we're in the mental health space, and, and many of us are diagnosed with mental illness very young, you know, between the ages of 16 and 24, and it's our, our first experiences with doctors that are because of this mental illness, and we're treated so you know poorly and dismissively, and we all assume it's because we're crazy, mm-hmm. that we're not being paid attention to because of our mental illness. Uh, and then we come to conferences like this, and we find out, no, it's not because we're mentally ill, it's just because we're ill. And, uh, you know, this is why I really think that, that physical health and mental health shouldn't be separated, because there's a whole group of mentally ill people that believe that the establishment, as it were, is ignoring them because they're mentally ill. And then there's a whole group of physically ill people that just know that this is just standard operating procedure. And that's why I really think that we need collectively to come together, because we're, we're, we're kind of splintered right now, we're letting them off the hook. Well, that's an important point. Yeah. I'll give you that for sure. Thank you, I didn't mean to interrupt. Please continue. No, no. Uh... I have an experience that kind of is the yes but to what you just said. Uh, I, needless to say, have been in therapy uh, trying to deal with PTSD and find better ways to manage the situation. And which means that, that this diagnosis of an anxiety disorder is in my medical record. Uh, after my treatments for cancer, I was supposed to get better and better and feel more and more like my old self, you know, close to my old self, maybe not totally, but close. But that's not what happened. In fact, I got worse and worse and worse and worse. And as I went from doctor to doctor saying, this is what's going on now, and then nine months, 12 months, 15 months later, there'd be a new symptom that would crop up, and I'd go to another specialist trying to find the answer for why am I not getting better and I got exactly that kind of treatment I have uh, one cardiologist that I visited for a second opinion she walked into the room and told me that she had been reading my chart uh, I told her very briefly what my issues were and she patted my arm and she said don't worry honey you're not going to die from this you're just anxious because you have an understandably scary diagnosis mind you this is what six years after my treatments have ended uh you know and i've been in therapy i mean the the, the cancer scare part is old news uh and i was and dismissed repeatedly that that was the most egregious example of somebody's looking at a mental health diagnosis in my medical chart and dismissing me and not listening to me because of that. And after that encounter, I actually took steps to shut down my electronic medical record so that nobody can access it outside of the institution where it's created because I don't want that happening to me again until I know everything about what's happening. Physically. That's actually not that uncommon of an experience. I speak to, speak with a lot of people who have mental illness and um, concerns in this area, and again and again I hear I'm 10 years out from having a, you know, one panic attack, and it is still on my records. So every time I walk into a doctor's office, whatever I complain about, it always goes back to my mental health. And, and that one panic attack, and that that one, 10 years ago. Yes, and it follows you around and they're not getting the medical care that they need and deserve because that's the first place that they go to, um, the doctors go to. So it's like we're kind of in this like catch-22 area where we look at physical health and mental health as separate entities, even though they're not, we do have research that shows that they're not and they're interrelated. But we also have such stigma in society and even within the medical profession that keeps people from hiding their mental illness. And we're not getting the treatment that we need and deserve 
Yeah, I, I mean, I, one of the things I'm hearing uh, already, just on this very small panel, is that um, the, the medical profession and the doctors and nurses who help treat our uh, physical condition often don't seem to have very much training or experience or knowledge when it comes to behavioral health and mental health. And that they are just kind of reinforcing all the stigma that you so often come across in society. Instead of being one of those beacons of light that you, you, you reach out for, you, you expect your doctor, your healthcare team to be educated and informed and enlightened about these things. And instead, I mean, we're hearing firsthand how instead you have people that still believe, oh, well, if you're complaining of this physical symptom and you have this mental health thing in your chart from 10 years ago, those two must be connected, obviously, right? Yeah. So I've, I've talked about tips for rare disease patients dealing with doctors when I was at Stanford Medicine X, and one of the things I talked about was what doctors do. You know, they only make one decision. That's, that's, that's the entirety of the office visit. And that is, do they treat, do they advise, do they refer? So in a sense, they're trying to figure out, is this their problem or someone else's problem? And that is a lot of what you're gonna see, yep. is if you have a panic attack, maybe this is, maybe this is my problem, problem. maybe this is my problem. You know, which is, and, and so, so with that one decision, that's what's happening in the clinical encounter. You know, I mean, there, there's, there's a lot of things going on, but that is the, the rubric they're following in their mind, even if they don't explain that to you. Those are the three action steps, because they're there for action. You know, this is, so I, I read this book on listening styles, and one of them is the action-oriented listener. When I talk about it, it's a paramedic. This is what action do I take to stabilize you? And that describes a vast amount of medicine. And there, it is, we don't want to put someone on a heart medicine for life if their discomfort is anxiety. We, you know, so, so that, yeah. So that's a lot of, I think, what happens to doctors. But they do reach for, you know, if, if, if you're greatly physical ill, they wish, you know, they, they offer you the, the chance to have mental health services. And if you have a mental health problem at 16, they tell you that that's why all rock songs exist or something, you know. <laughs> everyone's maudlin and, you know, angst ridden, you know. Yeah. So, yeah, I think, I mean, it is, it is a complicated circumstance. Absolutely. But, yeah. Yeah. but I forgot what the question was. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to take this in a slightly different direction. Please. Um, on one hand, there is the difficulty that I experienced of having a mental health uh, diagnosis in my record and not being able to get the necessary medical consideration for my failure to thrive. Um, but the opposite, the flip side of that is, at the time of my cancer diagnosis, uh, I was 100% afraid of the cancer. I was 99% afraid of the doctors. And, and I mean that literally, the monsters of my recurring nightmares were now standing in front of me saying, don't worry, we'll fix you. And these are my nightmare monsters on the scale, right? Um, I tried in the best way that I could, which in hindsight, would have been better. But at the time, I was doing the best I could to convey to my cancer treatment team that I had this huge mental health issue that I was struggling with just as badly as I was struggling to try not to die from cancer. It was very difficult for them to appreciate the seriousness of that mental health issue. And I think uh, that's an important piece for people in a lot of specialties, medical specialties, to pay attention to is you may have somebody coming in with a comorbid diagnosis, a mental health diagnosis, who needs medical care, but that medical care must be delivered within the context of their own mental health needs. 
not making an excuse for not providing medical care, but instead providing that care with the kind of sensitivity and awareness that that particular patient needs because of their mental health status. Yep, I agree. Absolutely, the context is everything. Absolutely. And not separating it out. It, it, again, it's health. It's not mental health, it's not physical health, it's health. If you're looking at it all, you have no place to refer because you would have an unhealthy patient in front of you. So you couldn't refer because you'd have to treat by acknowledging that they were unhealthy. So I just went to medical school just now. I've solved it. We're done. Thank you, everybody, for coming. Um, John. I'd like to switch gears a little bit here and um, talk a little bit about um, self care and, and what do you do um, to help yourself with um, your condition, with your, your mental health in, and your condition, and even self care when it comes to dealing with these um, medical professionals that aren't listening to you. Who would like to go first? Well, I guess I can go first. So I had to, I stayed away from from uh, all mental health services while I was home and while I was bed now. Because as I tell people, if you ask a sculptor for art, you're going to get sculpture. If I went to psychologists and psychiatrists, they were going to frame whatever they reported in that kind of way. So all I had was sort of versions of self care. And you know, there's that's that's the way I chose to manage that risk. You know, so um, it, with the risk that someone might write something about me that would show up ten years later and impede my ability to get a surgery or a medication or something. It was, I didn't, I, it was it was essential. So so yeah. So then you're left with with self care and how do you manage things? And one of the problems I had too was these doctors. These are the people that failed my mom my entire life. They had, they had 30 years to come up with any kind of answer, and I'm inventing it in my living room. You know, so this is difficult because I like my mom. You know, so, so this was, I had to figure out one of the bigger self care things I had to do was trying to figure out how do you forgive doctors? Because I knew I had to work with these folks, and I was going to give a presentation at a medical conference, and I don't have a focus base. So if they think that I, think they're stupid, they'll see that, but if they think that I don't like them, they're going to see that too. So it was this crash course on trying to figure out how to see the humanity in somebody who took an oath to try and help you and has come up empty for your entire family. And, you know, so that was, that was a big part of the self-care in thinking of how do I, how do I interface with the medical community in a healthy way. And, you know, and the other thing I did is I was sitting there laughing at people that, uh, you know, that, that can't figure things out when I was, you know, when they brought some lady on Oprah, you know, and, I, and she sounded a lot like me in my mindset. And I thought, well, I don't get to pretend, I don't get to do anything other than try my absolute best and still be able to live with myself sick. So I actually got a book from old Dr. Phil and the biggest takeaway I had from it wasn't what he wrote, it was the concept that you can think about your thinking. And this was, maybe we call it mindfulness now, even though mindfulness seems to have a lot of your breathing. You can think about your breathing, which is nice. But this was very much, you can think about your thinking. And it gave me insights into me, and then it gave me insights into other people. But it let me know that, that feelings were information sources then I could try and figure out what the heck to do with those, rather than you know this caveman notion of of this animating spirit of I, I feel afraid or I am excited, you know. So that was a huge tool that is simple to describe, and once you realize it, you can get a feeling and just hit pause and go, what do I do with this? And and then choose. Yep. That was to me the most powerful life shaping self-care piece that I use, obviously, still today. Thank you. Well, I... The gentleman in the back, I'm touching for him. Yeah, technologically challenged. Uh, <laughs> what you said about uh, 
not having a poker face right. and being able to interact with doctors. Yeah. Um, I, as I said, I did my best when I was in cancer treatment, but my best always wasn't always admirable. <laughs> and I desperately, desperately, desperately wanted my doctors to understand where I was coming from, to understand how afraid I was of them. And I consistently found that 99% of the time they couldn't. It's like they kept missing the beat. Um, after my cancer treatments were done, talk about self-care, uh, as a part of trying to deal with the, the mental health, the anxiety, the mistrust of the medical profession, um, I decided that the shoe fit on the other foot as well. Not only did they not understand and get me, but I didn't get them. So I began, uh, for the sake of the illness, for the sake of the cancer, I began, re I had, from the get-go, I had started reading medical journal articles. And like you said, at first it was like, huh? But with time, it, it came. You know, I understand a lot more medically now. But I also began reading autobiographies written by various kinds of physicians and a few nurses. I wanted to understand what it was like to go to medical school. What's it like to be an intern? What's it like to be a resident, to be a surgeon, to be an anesthesiologist? And I, that's, it's part of my mental health care so that the monsters cease to be quite so scary as monsters and become people for me. Um, I do a lot of work with um, self-care and talking about self-care and um, right now in society we have this big self-care movements and a lot focuses on doing the self-care correctly. You have to be perfect in your self-care methods. You need to spend a lot of money to self-care. But for me, um, self-care is taking my medication, going on a walk, when I can. It's talking to my friends. It is using behavioral skills like mindfulness, which is being present, being aware of what's going on right now. Not thinking about yesterday, how I messed up 50,000 times, or tomorrow, or 20 years from now, it's just being here in the moment and enjoying it for the moment and not judging um, everything that's happening. And so those types of things have been really important to me. Um, I know that you've talked a little bit about doctors and, and how sometimes I feel that, feel that they have failed me. Um, but I also come from a medical family. Um, my uncle's a doctor. Um, my sister is a nurse, and my best friends are actually nurses. So I do love the medical profession. <laughs> but in my love, I also realize that there are parts that um, they can improve on, just that I can, as I can improve on myself. And so um, when I engage in self-care, I also make sure that I'm doing things like practicing empathy. So like reading a book by somebody that has a completely different perspective from me and seeing the world through somebody else's eyes, that's really a great way to focus on like compassion and reframe how you look at things. And sometimes it helps you feel that your life isn't quite so bad. Thank you. Thank you so much. We're, we have plenty of time, but we're getting near the end of the show. And one of the themes is that we should treat physical health and, and mental health exactly the same, which, which leads us to our next question. Uh, in your own words, what is your understanding of the difference between mental health and physical health? Because our society, for whatever reason, does feel there is a difference. So what is your understanding of that difference? 
and we can see other ways to envision them, then I think there'd be a lot of value in that for people. So. I think that uh, part of the issue is trying to distinguish between what is a character flaw and what is illness. And I don't know, I don't know where to draw those lines. I don't know what kind of rubric to use. Uh, my therapist, who's the head of the oncology psychiatry program at my hospital, mm -hmm. said uh, about depression and getting off the couch. He says, the issue is, if you could, would you like to? Thanks to a drug company that shall I sign the agreement remain nameless, uh, <laughs> I had the opportunity to experience a clinical depression in 2001. It was a reaction to a drug that I took, and lots of people had that same kind of reaction, hence the signed agreement. But what I learned was invaluable about what a true clinical depression is like. Uh, the question, the answer to the question of, if you could, would you? The answer was, hell no. I don't want to. I, 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 uh-uh, uh-uh. And when you have a physical issue that is causing a change in your behavior, um, the issue is, if I could, I would love to. And I think somewhere in there, there must be a guideline for separating out the difference between um, a character defect and a true mental slash physical problem that, that you're trying to cope with. Thank you. Do we want to just give 30 seconds to explain who we are specifically? I don't know, I mean, maybe you guys are gonna do that before podcast starts, I don't know, I, you know, in, you know, I know a little bit about Reed, but I, I don't, okay. you know, you're working with other patients, I kind of want to know why, that's, that's where the idea is. Sure. Okay, please. Yes, I'll leave you with those thoughts. Oh. <laughs> Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, so, before I got sick, um, I earned a master's degree in public health. I wanted to be a health educator, and I had started doing that. Um, I was very happy. And all of a sudden, I was blindsided by illness. And it took a while to become better enough to leave my house. Um, but during that time, I needed to do something that made me feel productive. So I got on Twitter. <laughs> and I found other people that were like me. And they had symptoms of depression. They were chronically ill. They had chronic pain. And I said, huh, this is fascinating. I need to learn more about this. Because the science person in me said, there's something really here. So I started talking to people, all sorts of people, and I loved it. I want to know, what is your story? You know, how are you coping? I would ask them, how are you today? And I would always get, oh, I'm fine. And then I would follow up with, no, how are you really? And people were always surprised by that. I really want to know, how are you? So I started doing a lot more work in not just advocating for um, chronic pain patients, but for mental health and doing more research in the area of chronic illness and mental health and where they converge because there are so many untold stories and I think it's important that we share them. Um, yeah, I was a regular college student for the most part when I was 21, and then I got sick. And I, I 
As I said, I spent 11 years homebound in Bed County, and I figured out that I had an autonomic nervous system problem. That this thing that controls a lot of the, you know, parameters the doctor might measure. That was sort of that. That was malfunctioning in me, and I found blood flitter. You know, and yeah, it's um. So now that I have better health, uh, I'm a speaker and I design workshops. But um, I sort of have stumbled into this community as well. I think I got it right. <laughs> um, I am retired. I had to take early retirement because I failed to thrive and recover after my cancer treatments, but in fact got worse and worse. And about a year and a half ago, a friend suggested that I have dysautonomia and it quacks like a duck and it walks like a duck. I suspect it's a duck. <laughs> but uh, be that as it may, I have uh, been retired. I do uh, editing, freelance editing and writing. I write for a small, growing local newspaper. I write a column on cancer and health issues. And I write for the Cure Today website. And I'm within two chapters of finishing a manuscript about um, what it's like to go through cancer treatment when you're just about as afraid of your doctors as you are for cancer. And that whole PTSD mental health issue. Um, and other than that, I take care of my animals and my property and play with my grandkids. <laughs> Thank you. So as we get near the end of uh, our show here today, I was just wondering if you had any final thoughts or feelings about the things that we talked about. Wanted to add a little one-minute summary or closing remark. The floor is yours. You can say whatever you want. <laughs> yeah, baby. <laughs> We're laughing a bit up here. <laughs> you can hear the microphone. Yeah. Looking at boy, mental health relates to quality of life as much as physical health. I mean, I in 2003, when I was at my worst, a friend said to me, this may be the healthiest you are for the rest of your life. And that scared me. Because if being ill left me miserable, then being worse physically was only going to be more miserable. Mm -hmm. And I had to figure out a way to be happy from the position I was in. And the scariest part of all of it to me was what if I got, if I couldn't figure out how to be happy while I was sick, what if I got the miracle and I found some other damn excuse when I got better? So that was not just mm -hmm. I need to be happy in the present or I might be sick a long time, mm -hmm. but the fear that what if I got my health back and I found some other reason to not be happy? That was a huge animating force in me having a, a, a boundless zeal for figuring out how to be balanced and find joy even in hard times. Um, my, I guess, closing thoughts would be that uh, it's taken a lot of work, but my mental health issues are more manageable now. I successfully had some surgery on my throat recently, uh, and I had um, an upper endoscopy. I mean, I closed my primary care provider's clinic down for two hours one day, having a PTSD reaction about that endoscopy. Three years later, I finally managed to actually do it. Um, it's, I, I've made progress, and you can make progress with these mental health issues, but it does take time, it takes effort, it takes a lot of understanding from the people around you and the society around you. Um, I'd like to finish with um, saying that it is important that we go out into society and help erase the stigma that surrounds seeking mental health treatment, um, especially in communities of color, um, marginalized communities, 
There is so much stigma, and it is literally killing people every single day. So be mindful of what you say. You don't know who is listening. Thank you so much, everybody. Uh, thank you very much. Big round of applause for our panel. Society for Participatory Medicine, to all of our listeners, and finally, thank you, our live audience, for uh, well, for being here. Uh, that concludes our show, and we will see you next week, everyone. Woo!